what do you feel that it will? Well, uh, uh, she was approached when, this, uh, when, the, when the film was uh, produced, she was approached uh, and asked if she wanted to write a theme song for the film. And, uh, and uh, well, she gets endless requests like that. But uh, because it was the movement, uh, uh, she instantly said yes. And uh, I'm very happy that she instantly turned to me and asked me if I would like to take part in this celebration of Tove. So we wrote this song. And, uh, and uh, uh, as you can hear, this is not your uh, ordinary children's film happy song. We tried to stay quite uh, true to uh, the art of Tove, which is to create something challenging but nice, melancholy but comforting. And uh, and uh, yeah, and the lyrics are, you know, they are not directly. I mean, there are themes in the lyrics from the book, the grey leaves, you know, the grey the gray leaves and flowers. The, they're walking over the sea, but but it's more like you know an, an evocation of this world that Tobe creates. Yeah. So if Tobe calls, you answer. You know, and it was wonderful to be able to to uh, to uh, yeah. To give something back. I mean, I didn't write any fan mail either, you know. So this is like a late coming fan mail to to Tobin. Yeah. That's lovely. I think um, I think because the conversation could be taken forward by Sam's reading, which is of the adult uh, section from the adult story. I think maybe we should do that sooner okay. rather than later. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, I'm hoping it will speak for itself and comment on what we've seen today. So this is from Arts and Nature, Short Stories, which is one of the sort of agenda. And that was published in written in nineteen seventy eight, published last year. Um, I can't read all of it to you, but I'll get that halfway through and that's in you. The cartoons. The newspaper had been running blubby for almost 20 years when Annings and quit and they were forced to continue the strip with a different artist. They had material for only a couple of weeks ahead, so the need was urgent. They had contractual agreements with other countries that promised a security margin of at least two months. And Blubby was a clever strip that tore along at a furious pace, so not just anyone could do it. They took a handful of artists on approval and gave them office space, which saved time on supervision. The same assignment for all of them, obviously. They dismissed two of them after only a few days and replaced them with others. The editor in charge went around a couple of times a day to have a look and help him get a handle on what the paper was after. He was a tall man by the name of Freer. He had a bad back, presumably because he was forever leaning down over cartoonists' drawing boards. There was one ambitious young artist who seemed to be the best of them, but he wasn't good enough yet. You have to remember, Freer said, you have to keep in mind the whole time that the tension hasn't mount. You've got a strip of three or four panels, five if absolutely necessary, but four's better. Okay, in the first one you resolve the tension from the previous day. Catharsis, relief, the drama continues. You build up new tension in the second panel, increase it in panel three, and so on. I'll explain that. You're good, but you get lost in details, commentary, embroidery. It gets in the way of the red thread. It has to be a straight line, simple, and move towards the peak, a climax, you see? I know, said Samuel Stanley. I know, I'm trying. <laughs> Imagine someone opening his newspaper three at one time. He's sleepy, he's in a lousy mood, he's in a hurry to get to work. He checks the headlines on page one and dives into the comics. He's in no condition to grasp subtleties right at the moment, that's too much to ask. But his curiosity needs a little excitement and he wants to laugh, wants to grin at something funny for a second. Natural enough, right? Okay, he gets all that. We give it to him. It's important. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, Stephen said. I think I got it from the beginning. <laughs> it's just that it all has to happen so quickly. I just don't have the space to get everything in and still do something good. <laughs> Not really. It'll be good, Fred said. You'll get there. Relax. I can tell you confidentially that you're one of the better ones. You draw well and your backgrounds are fine. I have to move on. <laughs> it was a very small room with brown walls, essentially just a storeroom weighed down with crowded shelves and cupboards, and a large, heavy, old-fashioned desk that had drawers all the way to the floor. The walls were covered with old calendars, clippings, ads, old posters, announcements, trunks of paper, all held in place by thumbtacks. The room gave an impression of a life that had passed long ago and been forgotten, a 
life no one had had time to tidy away. Samuel Stein liked the room. It gave him a feeling of being hidden and safe along with his work. And he liked being a cog in the machinery of the great distinguished newspaper, like feeling its respect. The room was very cold. He stood up and the chill engulfed him. The whole time he could hear the distant thudding of the printing presses and over them the sound of traffic on the street. He was freezing. A work blouse and a sweater hung behind the door. He put on the sweater and stuck his hands into the pockets. In the right pocket, Sam Stein found a piece of paper, a list. He read it standing <coughs> at the window. Used, it said in very small letters. Ski, skate, etc. Fun of government and modern art. Went to ball, one mast, two cocktail. P. Gangster, astronaut, three times love, plus that out. Hamburger, Indian ink, lighter background, long grid call, AG. It was a cartoonist who had worked here, and the sweater was his. Stein was curious and opened a drawer. It contained a mix of pencil stumps, tape, empty ink bottles, paper clips, all the usual junk. But maybe worse than usual. All of it had been stirred together as if in a rage. He opened the next drawer. It was empty, completely empty. He let the other drawers be and put on some water for tea. There was a hot plate on the floor under the window. It could have been Alexander who had this room. Maybe he never worked at home. Maybe he sat right here for 20 years and drew his blood in. He had stopped abruptly in the middle of the story. And he was supposed to give six months' notice. The outline had apparently got lost at the 53rd strip. Normal length was usually 80. Stein had asked why Allington couldn't reconstruct the story. No, he wasn't able to. Didn't he want to? Had he forgotten? I don't know, Fried said. It was a different department that took care of that. Don't worry about it. Go on from where he stopped and do something of your own, but preferably so no one will see the break. You can leave off the signature. The tea water was boiling. Stein removed the saucepan and pulled out the plug. He took down the cup and the sugar he found on the shelf. There was no spoon. He had his own tea bag. So, he finds Allington. in the suburbs. you don't have time to 